Welcome to the putback on SNY.TV. I'm Ian Begley, SNY's NBA insider. And we've got two great guests for you today. You're certainly familiar with these two. We've got Stefan Bondi, Nick Beat writer, NBA writer for the New York Post. And we have Tim Bontemps, national NBA writer. He's been around the Knicks a lot this season with ESPN. And we're going to get kicked off, gentlemen, with the baseline. A little look back at this season, Knicks coming into it off of a 47-win season, dealing with a ton of injuries in the middle of this thing. You guys know Julius Randle, OG Ananobi, Mitchell Robinson, Isaiah Hartenstein also nicked up. And through it all, the constant was Jalen Brunson. He helped carry this group through that time period where there was no OG and no Julius Randle. They treaded water, and here they are. Number two seed, the highest finish for the franchise since 2012, 2013. And I think the most optimistic I've seen fans about a Nick team since I've been covering them because of the foundation that's in place. Steph, what did you make of their, their run this season? Yeah, I mean, you nailed it. It was um, very positive. It, I mean, it would have been positive even if they had their whole team together, but they dealt with a bunch of injuries. Uh, first, that injury to Mitchell Robinson. He and, and people forget when he was hurt, when he he fractured that ankle, people were talking about him as a de- defensive player of the year candidate in all defense selection. So they lost him. Uh, they plugged that hole with Hartenstein. He had the best season of his career. Uh, Julius Randle made his uh, third All Star team with the New- with the Knicks. He got hurt. Everybody was saying, "Well, you know, there's not there's no way they're going to be able to maintain the pace they were on." Guess what they did? I mean, guys had career years. Um, I think a lot of the credit belongs to Tom Thibodeau, who helped push a lot of these guys to put them in the right position for them to succeed. So, listen, an overall positive year, especially considering the circumstances. Tim, what about Tom Thibodeau and his role in how they were able to navigate things? And and here he is, uh, you know, entering the last year of his deal. But he's been, to me, the best Nick coach uh, maybe since Jeff Van Gundy. And so how, how do you view Thibodeau's role in all this? Well, that's a pretty low bar, I think it's safe to say, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> for the way the last 25 years or so have gone. But, yeah, look, it's impossible to argue. And, and look, this is a team, the Knicks team, that is built in the image of Tibbs, right? It's a bunch of hardworking grinders. Obviously, Jalen Brunson, with his very long history with Tom Thibodeau, is a perfect match with him as the leader of the team. You know, you can hear him saying all the same Tibbisms about you know, the beauty's in the work and just play the next game and next man up and all the stuff that Tom says all the time. But you could see, and, you know, Steph went through the litany of injuries that this team has had, and it would have been very easy, as he correctly pointed out, at a lot of points for this team to say, ah, you know, it's just not our year. We're just we're having bad luck, you know, between Mitch and Julius Randle getting hurt and OG and OB missing time and all the various things that have gone on. And what the Knicks had did instead was – put their hard hats on and go back to work and grind their way through the season. And, you know, Dante DiVincenzo had a career year. Jalen Brunson had a career year. Isaiah Hartenstein had a career year. They did a tremendous job when they traded it. Emmanuel quickly immediately signing Deuce McBride to one of the best, best contracts in the league and having him become an immediate contributor because they had seen him internally develop and knew he could step into that role and play well. And you look at where this team sits and it, it's a hell of a season to get to the two seed in the East. Obviously, they could have a difficult first-round series ahead, but you know, for a franchise that has spent a long time in the wilderness, this is another step in them building in the right direction, and you know, it, it sets up for what should be a really fun first-round series and what could be a really long and fun playoff run. Yeah, looking at the big picture here in the East, and we'll find out who the Knicks play in the first round on Wednesday, the winner of that Philly-Miami playing game. But you look at Milwaukee, Giannis, banged up. I don't, nobody really knows when and if he's going to come back. Uh, Damian Lillard on his own. Uh, we'll see how that Milwaukee group looks. And Cleveland that haven't played great as of late. They, the, I guess the kids say the vibes, the vibes with that group and that locker room doesn't seem spectacular. And so you look at the teams that are near the Knicks and it seems to me like there is a pathway for them to get to the conference final. Steph Am I reading this right? How do you see the board? Yeah, I mean, the obviously the Celtics are in another stratosphere, but after that, I mean, it's almost pick them uh, with the way the Bucks have been playing. Uh, you know, I, I don't know where Giannis's health is going to be at. I think he's obviously a big-time game changer. 
But, you know, that that's that Bucks team, other than Giannis, I thought Dame Lillard was underwhelming this season. Um, I think that trade that they, you know, swapping out Drew Holiday for Dame Lillard is not going to help them as much as they thought they did, um, as, as they thought they that it would. Yeah, I mean, you know, right after the Celtics, the Knicks are in that group um, that can certainly get to the conference final. And, um, you know, once you get to a seven-game series against, um, you know, Joe Mazzulla, you don't know what's going to happen. So I think the Knicks are in a good position. Um, still, when you look at, you know, the health of everybody, and, and I'm assuming Giannis Antetokounmpo and Joel Embiid are going to be healthy, the Knicks are the only team in the East right now that are missing – they are one or two player, and I'm talking about Julius Randle, who's not going to be available. And you can argue whether they're a better team with or without him, but um, I think you know that's going to factor into the playoffs because when you get when you get to these schemes and you, they they're going to start blitzing Jalen Brunson, I think they're going to need somebody else to take over that scoring. And I, I don't see that with the Knicks right now. Um, I think that's going to be their biggest problem. Yeah, I mean, you saw that in that Oklahoma City game a couple of weeks ago, right, when Jalen Brunson had the ball in his hands and they're playing an elite team, and it was a lot of move the ball around the perimeter and hope that either Jalen makes a play or somebody makes a three. And when they get into these high-level playoff series, that could be something that ends up coming back to, to haunt them. But to Steph's point, outside of Boston, the Knicks are right there with anybody in the East, even with Julius's injury. We'll see what happens with Giannis. We'll see what happens with Embiid. But, you know, they, they are as good, clearly, as anybody. And the most important thing is by winning that game yesterday and getting the second seed, they're going to ensure they've got home court advantage against all these other teams, whoever they get, whether it's Milwaukee or Indiana, if they get out of the second round and obviously against either Phil and Miami in the first and having that seventh game at home could make a massive difference uh, in both those series. And, you know, again, there's zero reason to think they can't win two series and get back to the conference finals for the first time in a very long time. You know what? You're looking at the roster and you're looking at the schemes and you guys are talking about Jalen Brunson and him, you know, dealing with traps, dealing with pressure, getting off the ball, finding that outlet. I think something you've seen of late is getting uh, Isaiah Hartenstein, having him available as an outlet for Jalen when he gets doubled, uh, when he gets trapped. And Hartenstein's done a good job in that spot, as has Josh Hart. Uh, of late, you know, he's racking up so many assists, the triple doubles. I think he's done well there. But as you, got, you guys are saying it, and you're right, the playoffs are certainly a different animal. Let's focus in on Brunson for a minute here because he is the third player in NBA history with 28 or more points, six or more assists, 40% or more from three while playing at least 77 games. The others on that list, Larry Bird and Steph Curry. Where does this season rank for you guys in recent individual seasons from a Nick? From recent seasons from Knicks or from yeah, the NBA? Yeah, sorry. Recent individual seasons from a Nick. Uh, well, I mean, you know, the only one that's comparable, I think, is Carmelo Anthony in 2012, 2013, and I think he surpassed them. So I can't even think of a recent example that would even compare to the season Jalen Brunson has had. And what's what's most impressive watching him from a night in night out basis is the opposing team knows exactly what the Knicks are trying to do. They know exactly where the ball is going, and he he gets into that paint and he drives and he has a million moves. He pivots. He 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 cuts. He does a million things. There he has the defense totally fooled. Uh, he either draws a foul. He could he he can shoot the three at a high level. Um, he can convert under the basket. I, I I I've been trying to think, and I'm. I'm Saying Jalen Brunson is six foot one, because uh, I don't care what yeah. they list him as. He's six foot one. Yeah. He when might was the last one. time? When was the last time a player that size had this type of offensive season? Um, and I couldn't think of anybody. I mean, people brought up Isaiah Thomas with the Celtics a couple years ago. I think it's, he's been better. I think you have to go all the way back that's, to Allen Iverson. That's that's probably the right answer. I mean, Isaiah Thomas with the Celtics had some pretty monster offensive seasons. I mean, he was up near 30 points a game. He was driving the team in a similar manner. But look, whether you want to say I, whether you want to say Isaiah Thomas, whoever, the bottom line is, yeah, to your, I completely agree with you. This is the best Knicks season in probably since the 90s, probably since Patrick Ewing was in his heyday. And when you combine the way that Jalen Brunson led this team through this season – when you combine it with the way he has played, combine it with the way he has evolved as a player and improved as a player, I've got to vote. He's going to be my most improved player uh, for this season. I mean, this is a guy who did not make the all-star team last year. Now, should have, in my opinion, but didn't. And he's going to be 
fifth on my MVP ballot, and he's going to be a first team All NBA player as a you know as a guy who a couple of years ago the Mavs had a chance to sign for essentially the mid level exception and didn't want to do it. It's one of the more remarkable individual improvement stories in recent memory in the league, maybe in the history of the league. And it's the kind of thing that if you're a team trying to build a championship team for all the things you can do where you uh, structurally make the right decisions, you got to get lucky and whatever else you want to say about the connections the Knicks had to Jalen Brunson and getting him in the building. I don't think anybody outside of maybe Jalen Brunson's own mind thought he had any chance of being this level of player and him becoming a bona fide all NBA guard like he has, and to Steph's point, doing stuff when the other team knows exactly what's coming every game and still finding a way to be successful. It's that is the single biggest thing that has changed the entire trajectory of the Knicks and's got them in a position where if they can add another piece or two, they are a team that's gonna legitimately be a title contender for the first time in a generation. Tim, two quick things there. I would also put Rick Brunson on the list of people who felt Jalen could make Fair. this leap. No, and I don't even think I, I don't even think Rick. I don't even think Rick thought this. Huh? I don't Interesting. Tell that. Interesting. Yeah, but but I'll tell you. I, you know what's funny about that, Tim? Is um, I had Jalen Brunson second on my most improved last year, and for you to vote him first, that just shows how much this. Tr- I mean, it's like it's like this. Yeah, it's incredible it's what he's been doing yeah. since he got here. That's Tim, amazing. You, you mentioned first team All NBA. You are are voting on that team. Is that correct? Yep. And he will be first team for you. That's uh, yep. Do you think? I mean, you can't speak for other voters, but to you, to you, does he have a clear case for first team at this point? I, I mean, look, I think there's four guys who are first team All NBA players this year, um, and they're the top four guys of my MVP ballot. It's Nikola Jokic, Luka Doncic, Shigilis Alexander, and Giannis Antetokounmpo. Who I'll vote in that order. I would say the fifth spot probably comes down on both the MVP ballot and the first team All NBA ballot to uh, some combination of Jalen, Jason Tatum, and Kawhi Leonard for most people, and maybe Anthony Edwards will get in there too. Um, but from an MVP standpoint, I don't really think it's up for debate because the Celtics obviously are a fantastic team and deep across the board. The Knicks, as we've talked about a bunch, have dealt with a ton of injuries and. They don't, especially with Julius Randle out for the past three months. I mean, they are, I mean, you guys watch it every day and everybody watching obviously sees it all the time. Jalen Brunson has an insane load that he's got to carry every day. And he has put the team literally on his back and dragged them along and gotten them into the two seed. So I think from a value proposition, he's clearly been one of the most valuable players in the league. If you want to quibble about whether he's quite on all of the first team NBA or he should be second, that's fine. The bottom line is he's going to be, a, at minimum, a second-team All-NBA player, and he's going to get a bunch of MVP votes. And the fact that we're even having this discussion goes back to everything we said. It's just a truly remarkable ability from him to get better as a player and develop and put in all this work. And, you know, it's the combination of him and Tibbs that has really laid the foundation for what this team is about and how they go about their business every day. And... We'll see what that translates to over the next few weeks. But regardless of how this season goes, whether it ends in two weeks or in two months, the Knicks have got about as bright a future as any team in the league because of that, that combination of flexibility of assets they've got going forward. Yeah, Tim, Tim's going to have a lot of Tim's going to have a lot of ticked off Celtics fans at him. That's what I'm, that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> he's used to that. Listen, Jason Tatum's had a heck of a player, had a heck of a year, and he's a heck of a player. But his numbers are down in part because their team is awesome. Like, yeah. Just it's not a it's not a really a criticism of him. It's more just praise for Jalen Brunson and the way he's played and just the immense load he's got to carry on a nightly basis. Jason Tatum doesn't have to do that because their team is so much deeper and better. Just looking ahead to the summer quickly, we'll get back to the playoffs and the and the current roster. But Brunson, extension eligible, our old buddy, old the operative word there, Steve Popper was on a show a <laughs> week ago and he said uh, he was hearing that Brunson would be open to an extension. I've heard similar, the, you know, just. You think he'd be open to an extension be, to get a massive he, race to stay with the Knicks? Well, no, I no, feel no, pretty no, confident no, he's going to do that. Tim, hold on. He could be a free agent and make a lot more money, as you know. So, yeah, I know. There's I that. Know. He'd be leaving a lot of money on the table. I think he's open to it. I think, you know, uh, from just right now, what I had heard is they don't, he doesn't really care about, you know, being a headline money making player as a free agent. He's not caught up in that stuff. He, he likes it here. He, 
really wants to see this organization keep going in this direction and to have success with him here. So I think they're open to it, but I think there are other factors at play beyond the money that will uh, will come into it. But it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. I, w- I will say really quick, if they are able to sign Jalen Brunson for a dollar less than the max, with the, with the way the new rules are coming into effect over the next couple of years, every dollar that you save, no matter how much money you have as an organization, means a lot from a flexibility standpoint going forward with your roster to make moves, to add players, to make trades, where you can aggregate salary, a lot of different things. So I, certainly Jalen Brunson isn't going anywhere. I think we all know that. He's going to be a Nick for a very long time. Um, but if he is open to signing for less than the absolute max he can get, the Knicks should do it because it's both going to be a good contract for them and it's also going to give them a better chance of staying out of the second apron, giving them the ability to still be positioned with all their assets and all their draft picks and stuff to be able to go get, you know, the next true blue superstar player that becomes available. And and the money is substantial, the difference, because he's not making much in that final year because his, I think his contract, current contract is descending. So I think yes. it's a hundred million. So it's a hundred million dollar difference between what he can sign in an extension, and if he waits until free agency, now there's an extra year. Um, it he he uh, he loses a year, whatever, in free agency. So it it sort of evens itself out. But I've heard the same thing from Ian that he's open to signing that extension, even though it would be leaving a substantial amount of money on the table. And think of, I mean, if you're Jalen Brunson, is there a better place in the world than the New York Knicks right now? I mean, he's got he's got his college teammates, he's got his father as an assistant coach. Um, he's got his father's buddy as the head coach. I mean, it's just the perfect situation. And he's running the city. Yeah. It's, it's, he's I guess doing, like I national he commercials. Was, I was just about to say he's on – I was I was flipping the channel. I see him on an AT&T commercial. I was like, when did this yep. happen? Yeah. He's in national, he's in national television, television commercials. He's on every billboard in the city. He's the biggest star in the city. I mean, you guys know, and the Knicks are playing like this, and they're up near the top of the Eastern Conference, and they got a chance to make a deep playoff run. Everybody here is a Knicks fan. They're the biggest team in the city. And it's just – it's the next few weeks are going to be really fun here. And, yeah, like there's no better job in the world than being the star player on the Knicks. Like because if the Knicks are good, you can ascend to godhood. Like it's – I mean, you look at Carmelo. We've joked about this at the games, right? Carmelo had an incredible career at the Knicks. He's a Hall of Fame player. He won one playoff series, and he's fed it every time he comes to the Garden like he's Michael Jordan. Yeah, <laughs> like, and and I'm not making fun of Carmelo. He had a great career, but like, yeah. you look at the you look at the situation there, and it's like, man, why don't more guys want to sign up for that? It's it's such an obvious uh, it's such an obvious thing to to have looks, that kind of situation. Well, and it looks know, like Mikael Bridges looks like Mikael Bridges might want to sign up for that. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know though, when you're struggling, it's probably the worst place to be if you're the top guy and the team's losing. Oh, that's true. You got to deal with well, stuff. On, but the upside is worth well, it. Steph, Steph Marbury did not have a good tenure in New York. I think it's safe to say, and he was just applauded like crazy last night. So yeah, or yesterday. So eventually they'll forgive. But, yes, eventually. Yeah, the, the, the time heals all wounds. But I think with the Carmella stuff, I'm just wondering when's that number seven going up in the rafters because. He's getting a lot of face time on the Jumbotron. I know that there's support for that to happen internally. I don't know if it's going to happen for sure, uh, but that's just something on my mind when you talk well, you about know, Carmelo. Anyway, go ahead. You know what's crazy, just real quick on that front, is like we're probably already at the point where it's someday Jalen Brunson's number is going to be up there. Like yeah. you have a couple more seasons like this, and, I mean, he's going to quickly ascend the list of all-time great Knicks players. And he's, it's only right, been a couple of years, brakes? but it's, it's been two years. Let's pump the brakes. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. The year isn't even over yet. We're already Listen. putting his number in the rafters. He just had the best year. We just agreed he's had the best year of this century of a Nick player. Okay. Like, yeah. is, is Bernard King's number up there? I forget. Yeah. I don't. He's up there. But, yeah, I isn't think it, it is. I no, think. I think he, I don't think he is. And I think that's the thing with Carmelo, yeah. like. How do you put Carmelo up there if you don't have Bernard King? And so I, I don't think he is. Maybe maybe James, our producer, could check on that. But um, yeah, just Tim is is a little bit premature. But I see where you're going, and I understand you. You look ahead a few years, and yeah, there's no reason to think he wouldn't be up there. 
It's just right. amazing we're yeah. having any of these conversations at all. It just sums it up how remarkable this is. And, like, the Knicks finally, after decades, have put themselves in a position where, like, you can really see a path to big-time expectations and big-time accomplishments, which, you know, it's just not something we've been able to say for a long time around here. Quickly on Bernard King, James Ward tells us Julius Randle wears 30. So obviously, Bernard that King is, I was going to say, <laughs> number is I was going to say, retired. that number's not retired. Uh, so going to Brunson to what I think you could make an argument for is the, the best free agency signing of this summer, because they had the best free agency signing two summers ago with Brunson. Dante DiVincenzo signed this past summer, and he has been fantastic for them. You know, particularly, Randall goes down, and Anobi goes down, and he steps up in a big way, uh, being a huge threat from the perimeter. Obviously, sets the franchise record, single-season record for three-pointers made, three-pointers attempted, defends, and he, they, don't, they, not, they are not where they are today, excuse me, without DiVincenzo. Uh, you guys follow the league. I mean, Tim... Did you see this coming from Dante this year? I thought this was a great signing last summer. There were I remember going on TV last July and uh, at the beginning of the summer and people were going crazy about the Lakers signing Gabe Vincent. And I said, well, maybe they could have signed Dante DiVincenzo for the full mid-level because the Knicks got him for even less than the full mid-level. And that being said, sort of like Jalen Brunson, did I think Dante DiVincenzo was going to come in and make 283s this year? No. I did not think that was going to be the case. Um, so it, it, it's been a remarkable season for him. And as you said, especially with Julius Randle going down, a big part of why the Knicks were able to survive this last couple months is because they had Dante DiVincenzo become this 10 three-point attempt a game bomber from the perimeter that allowed them to be able to score enough to, to hang in these games and, and to remain competitive. So, yeah, as a massive signing, and you know the other thing that you that you that's you know Steph mentioned it earlier, but you know the combination of him and Josh Hart and Jalen Brunson being together, obviously longtime friends, won a national championship at Villanova. Like you're around this team, and the chemistry and the vibes around the team are at an all-time high. And those guys are all right in the middle of it for obvious reasons. And it it's been a hand and glove fit. And you know it, it's it it certainly was when you talk about value contracts. You've got Jalen's contract, which is one of the value contracts in the league. And this DiVincenzo contract, he's a, a above-average starting shooting guard making $10 million a year. I mean, it's it's a fantastic value signing. And, you know, again, just another really solid transaction among a bunch of them that have put the Knicks in this position. Yeah, Tim, you mentioned the locker room. Just quickly yesterday, Jalen Brunson made a point to say that there's no finger-pointing, there's no blaming in that locker room. And, look, we've both covered – Plenty of teams between the Knicks and the Nets where there is blaming, there is finger pointing, and you know how much that can torpedo a season. So I think it's it's not unique, but it's it's rare for this to happen for a team that's under the microscope. And the, and he said, Jalen Brunson and Dante DiVincenzo said, you know, it's a credit to the coaches. It's a credit to where their focus is every day internally. And Dante said they actually really genuinely like each other. It's not just for the cameras. They want each other to do well, to succeed. So yeah, it's, it's, I haven't seen this kind of chemistry in the locker room just in the times that we get to see it, which is minimal uh, in a long time. So it, it, it seems like they're in a really good place. Let's get to quickly OG Bonds. I want to ask you about OG. I want to ask you about him, him coming back right from the elbow and where he is now. Is this behind him at this point? Do you see this potentially flaring up? He hasn't given us a ton on it, but it seems like mm -hmm. he's able to play night in and night out and take, you know, fall and, and get, uh, get banged around and still come back. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a doctor. I don't, I mean, obviously he could re-aggravate it at any point. Um, but for right now, it looks good. And I think his shot was a big question mark because he's that's a shooting elbow. And that looks good. Um, he clearly has no reservations about playing defense and playing hard. Um, so at least, you know, from watching him and, and talking to him, it doesn't seem like it's an issue now. You know, as... You know, it, as people who followed OG Ananobi for a long time, however, it, uh, have told me, he does get injured a lot. So, you know, I'm sure you're not completely out of the woods with OG, but for right now, it looks good. And, um, you know, you're just hoping that it doesn't get re-aggravated. Tim, I'm going to read a quote 
from Fred Van Vliet on OG. Fred says, you probably won't even see his true value until the playoffs. With all the different matchups, he could pretty much guard anybody. If the Knicks do get Philly, where do you see them putting OG Ananobi? Which player? Is it Maxi? Is it that obvious? Or do, do they go elsewhere? Do they put DiVincenzo on Maxi? How do you see OG impacting that hypothetical series? It's a good question. I haven't honestly had time to think about it um, yet because of everything else that's been going on. Uh, I mean, Tyrese is maybe a little bit small for OG to guard, maybe. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he'll spend some time on him. I would think Dante DiVincenzo probably makes more sense to put on him at first. Mm -hmm. But, look, OG will spend some time on Joel Embiid if he's right. I think, you know, probably if I was the Knicks, the thing I would do is probably put him on Tobias Harris, at least at first, and try to completely take Tobias out of the series because... You know, yes, you've got Maxi, and yes, you've got Embiid, but the Sixers don't have a ton of scoring outside of the two of them. And if you really shut Tobias down, then you're relying on Kelly Oubre to maybe provide some offense for you. And I just, you know, so I think the, the bottom line, though, is I, I think Fred's point is the important one, where when you have a guy like OG Ananobi, the thing the Knicks have tended to lack in the past is a true defensive ace that you can throw on any elite player on the other team. And if they get to the second round and they face Giannis or they are playing against Tyrese Halliburton or they're playing against Pascal Siakam or they're playing against Joel Embiid or Tyrese Maxey, at whatever point in the game you want, you could throw him on the best player on the, on the court offensively on the other team and he's going to give you a chance to stop him. And that kind of versatility defensively, you just don't see very often in the league. And it's why he's a coveted player and it's why, you know, whether it's with the Knicks or someone else, he's going to be making a heck of a lot of money this summer as a free agent. Yeah, and and I, quick, can I say go ahead? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Quick Seth. thing: what, on January fifth, when the Knicks blew the Sixers out of the water in Philly, OG guarded everybody. Um, yeah. He guarded Embiid. He guarded Tyrese Maxey. And I think, as Tim mentioned, yeah, I think he started on Tobias, but I can't remember exactly. Um, but he showed his worth defensively in that matchup, and the Knicks destroyed the Sixers that at night. They, cer the they certainly did. They did. That was a 30 point plus win. And that was when Miles McBride came in and knocked down a bunch of threes. Uh, a quick note on OG before we go to Matt Spenley. The interesting wrinkle to me, if it is Nick Sixers, look, I, I fully expect OG and an OB to re sign with the Knicks. But I think, I know in Philadelphia, if Paul George, that pursuit doesn't work out, I think. OG and an OB is certainly on their radar, and I think that they would be aggressive in their pursuit of Ananobi if Paul George doesn't work out and if they smell an opportunity there with Ananobi. They've had interest in him in the past via trade. They're going to have the money. They're going to have significant cap space. So, again, fully expect him back with the Knicks, given all the parameters at play. But and I think Philly would be aggressive there in the right circumstances. And now we go to our social media senior executive VP, Matt Spenley, with a fan question. Always coming up with something new every time, Ian. Something new. I love it, too. <laughs> all right. Um, Anas Chuiki on YouTube is asking, don't you feel like Randall's absence is a blessing in disguise? I don't subscribe to this theory, but let's spin this ahead a little bit and talk about how it might impact the Knicks in the playoffs. So, Tim, I want to come to you with this one. Um, just how the playoffs might look without the shot creation of Randall, I think, is my biggest concern. Um, I know, obviously, Jalen won't be sitting as many minutes in the playoffs and doesn't sit that many minutes anyway. But how do you anticipate them potentially having to adjust for not having a guy like Julius when the playoffs get underway? Well, look, this has been a question for a while, right? Because Julius Randle is a really, really good player, but he has certain strengths and weaknesses that can maybe be taken advantage of in a playoff series. Now, like you said, the difference is if you don't have Julius on the court, you have to make up for a lot of scoring. And this is not a team that has a ton of guys who you can give the ball and go get a shot and get a basket. It's really just Jalen Brunson. And... Like I said, I, I was sitting there watching that Thunder game a couple weeks ago. I think you saw how this could potentially go in the playoffs, where if you don't have the 24 points from Julius on a nightly basis that you got with him on the court, it's a lot of Jalen Brunson and then space into three and hoping guys hit shots. And maybe guys will hit shots because they do have really good shooters. And, you know, I don't I think OG Anunoby played in that game. I don't remember for sure. Obviously, if you got him out there with Josh Hart, you've got – two tremendous defensive wings. You've got DiVincenzo and Jalen in the backcourt. You've got Hartenstein who can handle the ball at um, the elbows and make plays there and, and spray the ball around. So they've got stuff they can do, but 
that is going to be the biggest question. Like Steph said, you look at these other elite teams in the East, as of today, assuming Giannis is healthy, assuming Joel is healthy, the main stars across the board are on the court, except for the Knicks, who are missing a 24-point-a-game All-Star. And at this time of year, when defenses are loaded up on your best players, shot creation is the biggest thing you have to find in, in a playoff series. And it's going to be very interesting to see what the Knicks do to try to make up for that with Julius not available. Yeah, I mean, listen, I agree. Um, I think when you talk about the shooters, a couple things. Offensively, I think that floater from Isaiah Hartenstein has become quite a weapon. Um, he's hitting that all the time, so that looks good. I like that. Um, but you never know you know, how role players adjust to the, to the postseason. I got to look back and see how Dante DiVincenzo – Played in the playoffs while he was with Milwaukee. Um, I know he missed that finals, that championship run because he was injured. Um, but, you know, you don't know how he's going to fire away, you know, on any given series. OG Ananobi, they're going to have to rely on him to hit some open threes in the corner. Josh Hart has never been a knockdown three-point shooter. And then, um, you know, I, you know, Mitchell Robinson is really – one dimensional offensively. So yeah, I, I could see some issues where they're gonna load up on Jalen Brunson and they're gonna miss Julius Randle offensively. I think defensively though, they're gonna be better without him because um you know J- Julius has had a knack for not really trying on that end. And we saw last year when Julius was dealing with that ankle injury, I thought he was actually a minus for them. Um so they still want to play off series despite Julius Randle playing it like a quarter, you know. 25%. So um, I think it's going to be an issue, certainly at the end of games, but I don't think you can. they're missing him and you can say, oh, well, now now they're going to lose in the first round. The one interesting thing out of la- yesterday's locker room, Dante DiVincenzo was saying that Julius Randle was just in touch with his teammates throughout his rehab and now post-surgery, encouraging them. And DiVincenzo said that you know that meant a lot, and that was something he said that's not talked about enough when you talk about Randle. Certainly, uh, the biggest lightning rod around this Nick team. That's been a, a consistent theme since he's been here. I'm sure that topic that was was brought up by that fan question is not going anywhere. Uh, but for us, real quick on the putback, you can find us on all podcast platforms. We are in podcast form now, so you could check us out there. You could check us out uh, YouTube on SNY.TV. We're on all SNY platforms, so just keep an eye on that. And what I want to where I want to go now, guys, and I know, Steph, we're going to get to you slash not get to you on this, but the Knicks better playoff opponent here, Miami, Philly, Tim, what's your read on that? I mean, look, they definitely, I think, should prefer to play Miami, but, uh, you know, the Heat have not looked like the same team they've been in the past. Jimmy Butler has not looked like the same player he was last year. Now, he could always turn it up in the playoffs. We've seen that before, obviously, and nobody's going to count the Heat out until they're beaten, but this does not look like the same Heat team of recent memory. Um, And, you know, if Joel Embiid is sitting there, he is the reigning MVP for a reason, and even in, you know, even as he's come back from his knee injury, he's averaging 39-5. and So, certainly, Philly would be a tough matchup, but look, I, I applaud the Knicks for going out and getting this two seed yesterday and putting themselves in position to get home court and stay on the opposite side of the bracket of Boston, the one team that they should be afraid of, like everybody should be in the Eastern Conference. And, you know, they're going to have home court. It's going to be at, at worst a toss up series. We'll see if Joel Embiid is healthy and ready to go. He sat out Sunday's game against Brooklyn. It was said to be precautionary from everyone I talked to, but. Let's see what he looks like. He looked like he tweaked that knee in their win Friday over Orlando. Um, But, yeah, if you're just saying, would you rather play a Miami team that sort of scuffled its way through the year or a Philadelphia team that's won a ton of its games when Joel Embiid's been healthy, you'd rather play Miami. But the Knicks have shown all year they're not afraid of anybody, and I think they've got a live shot, certainly, or better than that, obviously, to beat either of these teams. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. Go ahead, Steph. I was going to push back on oh, this is this Miami team isn't as good as the anyone in recent memory Tim said. What, what like last year? What, how are they any different from last year? I mean they they were in the Jimmy play in were, series. Last, they were in the play. When Jimmy Butler last played year. last I know, but when Jimmy Butler played last year, I think I voted him first team NBA last year, might have been 2 years ago, but when he played last year, he was at a different level. And so I thought I didn't think I'm not sitting here saying I predicted Miami to beat Milwaukee. I didn't. But going into that series, Miami 
you felt like Miami had more of a chance because you felt like Jimmy was playing like a top 10 player in the league. He hasn't been playing like that kind of level this year. Now, maybe again, he will turn it up now and things will look different. But you look over the last week and a half, Miami had three games, home against Philly, at Indiana, home against Dallas. They win one of those games, they're the five seed. They lost them all. And Jimmy Butler, down the stretch in those games, didn't get it done in any of those games. And those were playoff games that they treated like playoff games. So, again, I understand why people would say you look at the runs Miami's had as a lower seed the past few years and don't write them off. And I'm not saying you should just say they've got no chance to win. But I don't think they are the same team that we've seen recently. And they shouldn't, to me, strike the same sort of fear factor in teams as they recently have. And certainly, I think if you're picking between them and Philly, I'd take my chances with Miami if as winning that game and seeing what happens. Hey Tim, guys, I know I know you're a big I know you're a big Joel and B fan, but how many conference finals has he been to compared to Jimmy Butler? That's all I'm gonna say. And uh before I mean, we move on, guys, can, can, we, with that? can we isolate Bon Temps on Butler? I just want to get that clip so I could send it over to Bernie <laughs> Lee. I just want <laughs> let's get that in front of Jimmy's face before the playoffs and then we'll see what happens. I'm sure I'm sure Bernie has already found it, even though it's uh just been said. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure it happens for you, Ian. I'll make sure it happens, all right? There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I- I'm with you, Tim, on Philly, and I would ask Steph for his prediction, but he is saving that for tomorrow's New York Post. He's going to have a column on his thoughts on who the better matchup is, Knicks, uh, excuse me, S- <laughs> Sixers or Heat. So be sure to pick up the paper, check it out online, uh, wherever you get your New York Post on the app. Check it out there tomorrow. Uh, Mark Hale, you're welcome. And But, Steph, I do want to ask you about your tweet, because you tweeted that you thought the Knicks should have lost yesterday to avoid the scenario they're in. Uh, what was your thought process there? Do you still feel that way? Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, I think that they they shouldn't have gone into the game thinking that they should lose that game. But there was an opportunity when that game was going to overtime. And, I listen, I understand Both sides of this. I understand why you want to play to the finish. I understand why you want to win. Uh, You don't want to try to manipulate the um, the seedings and upset the basketball gods. I get all that. But there was an opportunity when the Knicks very clearly knew that if they were going to win that game, they were going to either play Philadelphia and Miami, two teams I would not want to play compared to Orlando and Indiana and Cleveland. that if they had lost that game, they would not be playing those teams. And they went into that overtime. They still brought back Jalen Brunson. They obviously tried to win. DeMar DeRozan had a had a real good opportunity to win that game for Chicago anyway, and he missed a shot. He's going to make eight times out of ten. Um, but there was an opportunity there for the Knicks to try to manipulate things, and they decided not to. I would have gone the other direction. I would have tried to manipulate things because I do not want a first-round matchup against Miami or, or Philadelphia. You know what? We're going to uh, circle my, back my on thoughts that. on. Go ahead. My Go thoughts ahead, on this are very much. My thoughts on this are very much on the record. Uh, however, I will just briefly say that uh, you are sending a horrific message to your team if you tank out of a game to avoid a matchup. That's you what Cleveland did. Sending, That's what Cleveland did. Yes, and that you was yes, and it Cavs, was an embarrassing. Right? It was an. I I obliterated the Cavs repeatedly, and it was a horrific thing that they did, and it showed that they have no faith in their team to beat anybody. And look, if the Knicks, what is the goal? The Knicks' goal is not to win a series, right? The Knicks' goal is to win a championship. So they should not be afraid of Philadelphia. They should not be afraid of Miami. They should not be afraid of Indiana or Milwaukee or any of these teams. And they had a chance to win the two seed on their home court, and they went and won it. And if they had gotten Indiana and won in the, if they'd lost that game in overtime, let's say they sit everybody and they lose the game. And then they're playing Philadelphia in the second round. Philadelphia is going to sit there and say, hey, these guys were scared to play us in the first round. Oh, come on. They didn't want to play Tim, us. I would, they much wanted- rather, no, it's not too. I would much rather have Joel Embiid after he's already, his knees banged up, whatever, in the second round as opposed to the first round. Much rather have Joel Embiid in the second round. I mean, we don't even know if he's going to play on Wednesday. So, he's going again, to play I, he's going I, just, play. I just think it's a horrific message to send to your team that you're not good enough to beat somebody. Play the games in front of you, get the highest seed you can, get home court advantage in every round, and give yourself the best chance to get all the way through 
and show you have belief in your team that you can go out there and win any game against anybody. I don't, I just, we covered the Nets 10 years ago when they tanked out of playing a Chicago team with Joe Kim No on one leg and it cost themselves a chance to get to the conference finals and get Dwayne Wade on one knee at that point. I mean, just, I'm totally against the idea of it. All right, that, we know who is co- who's coaching that Chicago team, by the way. Tom Thibodeau. That's why I brought it uh, up. Uh, there you go. And there's nothing like a Bontemps Bondi debate. I'm so glad we were able to bring it to our air. I've heard it for years on press row, and it's always <laughs> fantastic. And usually, the language gets a little more colorful off camera, but you guys got the gist of it here. Um, Tim, <laughs> Steph, really appreciate you guys joining us, giving so much of your time here to talk Knicks and the playoffs. Thank you so much. That'll do it for us on the putback. We will be back on Friday. To break all things down, Nick's first round series, whether it's Philly, whether it's Miami, we'll be back Friday at noon for you. So keep an eye on us there and keep an eye on Honda Sports Night every night on SNY for your nightly Knicks coverage.